How's it going, everyone? Uh, we're going to dig into the Tattooed Chef results here in just a second. Not great results. So uh, just wrapping something up here, but we'll go through them here. A little bit disappointing. Uh, they they had a big loss. The revenue actually went down since last quarter when they didn't really have that high expectation for the quarter. It was actually, on, the analysts were saying only 1.3 million more than last quarter. So pretty disappointing, like I said. Well, let me just uh, pull up my other screen and we'll take a look at some of the numbers here. So in case you're wondering, Tattooed Chef is my largest holding too. So that is not great uh, <laughs> that, that we had such a rough, rough uh, earnings, but I'm not selling. I'm not doing anything like that. Um, just going to hold tight here. I do want to pull this up though, so that we can take a look at it here together. Okay. So you should be able to see this now. Okay. So this is the first quarter results just for reference here. And we'll get into the earnings call here. It starts at 4 30 uh, Eastern time. So seven minutes. Revenue was 52.7 million last quarter. Gross profit of 13.7 million. Net loss was 7.9. Okay. That wasn't a great uh, quarter in terms of loss or anything like that, but we don't really care about that. We're really focused on growing. Revenue was up significantly. It was at under 40 million the quarter before, and it went up to 52.7. Now, second quarter, let's take a look. We have their earnings come out 50.7 million. So we actually had a decrease of 2 million over the quarter. It was an increase since last year, but still a decrease since last quarter. Gross profit was 8 million. So down about 5.7 million. Net loss was 53.2 million. Now this was because of a one-time non-cash expense of 46 million uh, from a from a deferred taxed asset due to additional investments. They don't really break down anymore what that is here. I'm sure that they well they might answer that on the call. Revenue increased by 16 million uh, to 50.7 million from the year before. Gross profit, operating expenses increased um, due to marketing expenses, professional services, and legal accounting of 2.6 million. Here they go over the same thing, uh, the tax deferred asset. Now, one thing that I do want to cover is their 2021 outlook. So they did give kind of an update on this since last quarter. They do say too, they have cash and cash equivalents of 140.2 million. Let's see what that was compared to last quarter, 185 million. Here, last quarter, they said that uh, they said 235 to 242. And they said a 13 to 20 million contribution from the two facilities, including the Foods of New Mexico acquisition. This revenue guidance excludes any revenue from the Karsten facility, not in operation. The company expects to update guidance once production begins at that facility in the coming months. So they said that they they thought production would begin at the, in the coming months, or they said that they would at least update guidance once production begins in the coming months. However, this quarter they say, the company does not expect to have the second facility, Karsten, to have a material impact on 2021 revenue because of the timing of equipment being installed during the fourth quarter. So it sounds like they are they got pushed back a little bit. Uh, maybe there's some supply issues, but that doesn't seem like that's going to be included. Now, they still are saying 235 to 242. That would be a little bit difficult, right? Because they had 52 million, then 50 million. They would have to have two, two quarters with 65 to 70 million. So maybe we will see a very strong end of the year where they do increase significantly. And maybe part of the reason that they are down right now, or part of the reason that the, the numbers were down was due to the fact that we're in summer. People are eating out. I just filmed a video talking about my expenses, my monthly expenses, and I ate out a lot. So it might be that uh, for some of the bears, they might be saying, hey, they're not going SPAC anymore. So there aren't as many people looking at, there aren't as many people trying it out. Now I covered some information in a video earlier they are in two new brands. <clears throat> um, one is, uh, what is it? I forgot how do you, how, what the acronym is, but 
Uh, they're in two new branded stores that both have 340 locations. <clears throat> so that increases them to 680 new locations to two different sets of like grocery stores. And they said that they are firing on all cylinders, winning distribution and leading national retailers like Kroger, Publix, Alberstons, and our velocities are outperforming the competition. By the end of the year, or by the end of the third quarter, we expect our tattoo branded products will be in over 12,000 retail stores, exceeding our previous goal of 10,000 stores. Also, uh, they, they said that they have ample production capacity to achieve 500 million in the in revenue in the places that they're in now, the facilities. They're still in the early innings of growth as we prepare to expand Tattooed Chef beyond the frozen aisle and into the refrigerated and ambient products later this year or early next year with our new manufacturing capabilities, uh, meat alternatives, alternative tortillas and stuff like that. Okay, so pretty disapp disappointing quarter. Let's see what, uh, what the stock is doing. It was down significantly when I looked. Yep, down 10% after hours. So as my largest holding, I would have loved if they had smashed earnings. I'm not selling because of this news. Uh, just just a little bit disappointed that it wasn't better. Uh, I, I thought we were set up for a very good quarter because the expectations were a little bit low. But uh, you know, a lot of COVID restrictions were also being waived around this last quarter too. So maybe that was part of it. Now, let me pull up some questions, see if we have any questions or anything that we want to talk about before the earnings call. Earnings call does start here in about two minutes. So I'll pull that up. I have it here somewhere. There we go. Okay. Okay, so they're just playing music now. Let's uh, Let's answer some questions. Uh, someone says I might have to change my profile pic. I look high. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. Um, I, when I smile, my eyes just squint. Yep. The, the stock's down 8% already. Not great. Not great. Uh, are the numbers out? Yes. Yes, they are. They are out. 11% before earnings WTF. Yeah. Uh, after they came out, stock definitely fell. Also, on another note, uh, kind of an unrelated to Tattooed Chef note, one of my other larger holdings uh, is Disney. And it's probably, it's in my top seven or eight probably. And they had uh, pretty good earnings. They beat expectations. They're up five and a half percent right now. They beat on earnings and on revenue. So that that's pretty good. What should we buy the dip on? Uh, so I haven't bought Tattoo Jeff yet, but I will be buying. I'm guessing uh, here in the next few minutes, probably when we're when we're um, streaming this. Someone says when you buy Tattoo Jeff before earnings, yeah, it's always uh, it's kind of always a, a gamble when you're buying before earnings, even after earnings. Like there's a lot of fluctuation around earnings, so. Things could definitely fall further, but things could also recover and maybe we're up, we're down like 5% tomorrow instead of 10. So definitely could um, could rebound a little bit. Someone says, good thing you got out. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell now, right? One quarter doesn't mean much uh, in the grand scheme of things. I think we all kind of look at everything for the last couple months or the coming couple months, but a lot of us need to look years out, right? We're not looking at short-term profits for a lot of us. A lot of us just want to be able to gain our wealth before we retire. So, or grow our wealth before we retire. So I don't really care. I mean, if a company, if a company stays at the same price for years and I can keep on buying and I still feel very strongly about it, I'm okay with it staying around the same price. Someone says that, oh, Kyle, you said that you put it all into CRSR. Yeah, I bought some too after their earnings. I was pretty excited to be able to buy them uh, at like the low 26s, even 27s. I mean, it's it's just too low. I fell for the pump and dump never again. I don't know if I'd say it's a pump and dump, right? Uh, uh, I don't know if you call a pump and dump 
if you call this a pump and dump anyways, or if it could even be considered because it's dumping after earnings, usually a pump and dump is like uh, someone hypes it up and then they sell off or a community get behind, gets behind it after like a large influencer talks about it. I, I'm guessing most of the people that hold a significant amount of Tattoo Chef aren't selling it on this news. Uh, super Pure uh, says that the, you think that the New Mexico might be the one-time expense that the facility that they got could be. Okay, we might be missing this. Let me play this. Okay. By now, everyone should have access to the earnings release, which went out at approximately 4.05 p.m. Eastern We're time good. today. We're good to go. If we you've not had a chance to review the release, it's available on the investor portion of our website at www.tattoochef.com. Before I begin, I'd like to remind everyone that the prepared remarks contain forward-looking statements. Such statements involve a number of known and unknown uncertainties, many of which are outside the company's control and cause, can cause future results, performance, or achievements to differ significantly from the results, performance, or achievements expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. Important factors and risks that could cause or contribute to such differences are detailed in the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Except as required by law, the company undertakes no obligation to update any forward-looking or other statements herein, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. In addition, within our earnings release and in today's prepared remarks, adjusted EBITDA is referenced. It is important to note that this is a non-GAAP financial measure that we believe is a useful metric that better reflects the performance of our business on an ongoing basis. A reconciliation of this non-GAAP financial measure to its most directly comparable GAAP financial measure is included in today's press release, which is also been posted on our website. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn the call over to Tattoo Chef's president and CEO, Sam Galetti. Thank you, Rachel, and good afternoon. I'll begin today's discussion with key business highlights new distribution wins, and an update on our recent acquisition of Foods in New Mexico. Then Sarah will discuss our marketing and innovation, and Stephanie will provide further detail on financials. Our momentum continued in the second quarter of 2021. Second quarter revenue increased 46% to $50.7 million compared to the second quarter last year driven by our Tattoo Chef branded products and $4.3 million from Foods in New Mexico. Our branded product sales for the second quarter of 2021 were $33.1 million. This is an increase of 62% compared to $20.4 million in the second quarter last year. As a percentage of total revenue, branded products accounted for 65% or 71% excluding foods in New Mexico. I'm proud to say that we are well ahead of plan to reach 75 to 80% branded sales within two to three years. We believe Tattoo Chef is positioned to be the leading plant-based food company for years to come. With fully vertically integrated production diversified product lines, and ability to win in multiple areas of the grocery stores, not only frozen, but refrigerated and ambient too, Tattoo Chef is positioned for long-term success. We are revolutionizing the way people think about plant-based eating by thoughtfully creating foods that feels good. The Tattoo Chef brand is chef created for every lifestyle and an accessible price point. The Tattoo Chef brand is for everyone and we attract consumers of all ages and demographics. We also have a range of products to offer from breakfast, lunch, dinner, or snacks so that you can enjoy Tattooed Chef at any occasion. It really resonates with both consumers and retailers as has been apparent through our sales velocities and product launches to date. We are proud to announce that in less than one year, we have two SKUs among the top 10 veggie entrees ranked by velocity according to the MULO HWI. As we previously announced, we closed our acquisition of New Mexico Food Distributors Inc. and Karsten Tortilla Factory LLC, collectively re referred to as Foods New Mexico on May 14th for approximately $37 million in cash. Frozen Mexican food is a $1 billion category and we are super excited about the growth opportunity. 
We will also be launching our first ever refrigerated Ambien products early next year, going after the $20 billion Hispanic Southwest food category with alternative tortillas, burritos, enchiladas, and other creations. This acquisition expands our own production capacity and diversifies our manufacturing capabilities to accelerate our expansion throughout the entire store, not just frozen. We plan to extend the Tattooed Chef reach not only within grocery, but to a whole new level of convenience in refrigerated and ambient products to an untapped market of retailers such as airports, convenience stores, and more. In two to three years, between all the innovative ideas we have, we believe Foods in New Mexico can contribute up to $200 million in revenue annually. The focus going forward will continue to be on Tattoo Chef branded plant-based products. We continue to look for similar acquisitions that we are able to add assets and manufacturing in order to develop new, product, new products in other categories and create shareholder value. Our growth story so far has been around diversifying Tattoo Chef customers and channels, and we have been incredibly successful. As you re may remember, at the end of 2020, our branded products were in nearly 4,300 stores and had 23,000 points of distribution. We have grown this to 8,355 stores at the end of Q2 with 48,070 points of distribution exceeding our previous projection. As you may also recall, our guidance for the full year was 10,000 stores with 65,000 points of distribution. With the additional retailer commitments our sales team has secured, which I will cover in a few moments, I'm proud to announce that by the end of the third quarter, we'll be in over 12,000 stores with 79,402 points of distribution. We continue to broaden our growth as measured by spins. Through July 11th, our TDPs have increased by over 135% since before closing the transaction in October. This is a strong example of the brand's viability and success in traditional retail and mass accounts. Our MULO consumption data as measured by spins continues to grow too. The second quarter of 2021 was our strongest quarter for measured consumption in the history of the company. I'm ecstatic to announce the last 24 weeks ending July 11, 2021, we had four of the top five best performing innovation SKUs in the plant-based frozen entree category, which Sarah will cover in a few moments. Overall, our quarterly consumption has increased by 88% since completing the transaction in October through strong growth in club, mass, and retail expansion. In the club channel, we had another successful MVM and Costco with organic rice cauliflower stir fry. We continue to partner and innovate with Costco with new items going into such selected regions across the U.S. In Sam's Clubs, we had three limited time offers in Q2, tempura green beans with wasabi, vegan wasabi ranch, rice cauliflower burrito blend, and our cauliflower pizza with plant-based pepperoni, in addition to our four everyday items. In Q3, we will have three limited time offers, including our Huevos Rancheros breakfast bowl, cheeseburger bowl, and a pad thai fried rice. According to spins in the club channel for the last 12 weeks ended July 11, 2021, Tattooed Chef is up over 60%. For the 52 weeks ended July 11, 2021, Tattooed Chef was up nearly 27% and remains one of the fastest growing brands in the frozen category. In the mass channel, latest 12 weeks through July 11, 2021, according to Mulo, we saw explosive growth from $119,000 last year to $4.2 million this year, primarily driven by store expansion and the new innovation within the Tattoo Chef brand. We continue to be excited by the results of the retailers that were early adopters of the brand. The combination of strong shelf presence and broad category assortment has led to very successful results that we believe can be scaled across the marketplace. In one specific mass retailer for the latest four weeks through July 11th, as measured by SPIN, Tattooed Chef has been number one and number two selling SKU in the frozen vegetable entree meals category in total dollar sales. 
Additionally, in the same category, the tattoo chef has the highest total sales per point of distribution of all brands being sold. These results support our growth strategy for expanded retail distribution and increased SKU count. We have more than doubled our ACV since the same time last year, and, and now we're in over half Walmarts in the U.S. and in almost every Target store. We continue to see TDPs increase in the mass channel. In the latest 52 weeks, we have grown our business in the mass channel from 651,000 last year to 7.9 million this year, and we expect this momentum to continue throughout the year. In the grocery and national channel, we continue to win distribution with both national and regional retailers in the U.S. Our products are resonating with retailers and consumers, and it is a flywheel effect once retailers see our case study. In Q2, we went on shelf at Whole Foods, Harris Teeter, Jewel, Smart and Final, Nuggets Markets in NorCal, and a variety of independent retailers. In Q3, we have begun distribution at Sprouts Farmers Market, Kroger, multiple Albertsons divisions, including the Southwest, SoCal, NorCal, Intermountain, Seattle, also HEB, Price Shoppers, and have additional commitments for later this quarter. We are pleased to also announce our most recent distribution win. Tachi Chef products will be available in public beginning in the fourth quarter. We are seeing our early retail wins expand their Tachi Chef offerings into additional categories which will increase the breadth of our distribution. We have set an internal goal of achieving 30 frozen SKUs per store across retail and are confident that we have the portfolio to execute that. We expect our incredible double digit total company growth to continue driven by our branded products in the back half of the year. We have multiple avenues for growth near term with expanding product offerings in existing retailers gaining more distribution with new retailers, including grocery and convenience stores, developing our food service business, as well as licensing and international opportunities. In 2021, we are reiterating our revenue guidance of $235 to $242 million, which Stephanie will expand upon in a few minutes. We are thrilled with our retail wins and how products have been performing. These distribution wins were already included in our original forecast for this year. And given the timing of the equipment we are putting into our Foods New Mexico facilities in the fourth quarter, as well as selling cycle on what we will like to call the COVID hangover, we will not see the full benefits of these items until fiscal 2022. In 2022, we continue to expect at least 300 million in revenue based on our distribution success in grocery this year and our innovation pipeline, including the launch of our first refrigerated and ambient products. We'll provide full guidance for fiscal 2022 and our fourth quarter earnings call next February. One of our key differentiators is our vertical integration and production capacity and capability. We have the ability to go to market in as little as three months, which gives us the ability to constantly innovate and stay on trend. We are, we are on track to quadruple our production capacity in 2021 and have approximately 275,000 square feet of manufacturing space today. Between our four manufacturing facilities, we believe we have the capacity available to achieve over 500 million in revenue. Our new capabilities in 2021 include gluten-free, soy-free, plant-based meat production, and with the Fusion New Mexico acquisition, we can now produce alternative tortillas, snacks, burritos, handhelds, quesadillas, enchiladas, and more. Since launching the Tattoo Chef brand in 2017, we have seen the brand and our innovative products resonate and appeal to a broad range of consumers. And in 2021, we have demonstrated the strength of the brand with the acceptance at retail. We have done what we said we would do from the beginning. And we firmly believe Tattoo Chef has the power to be a generational brand and a leader in plant-based food for years to come. Now is the time to invest in our business and lay the foundation for future growth and success. Plant-based food is here to stay. 
every category in the supermarket will be disrupted by a plant-based alternative, and Tattoo Chef is positioned to be the disruptor. We are already doing it, and it's just the beginning. And now I'd like to turn the call over to Sarah to discuss our innovation and our marketing efforts. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. At Tattooed Chef, innovation is part of our DNA, and we are paving the way in the plant-based revolution. Today, we offer more than 62 branded items, and we are continually bringing new ideas to the marketplace. In fact, we have a pipeline of over 250 ideas for innovation, including more than 50 in the Hispanic Southwest food category, which we plan to produce at our New Foods of New Mexico facilities. As we continue to innovate as a brand and expand into more channels, we are excited about our partnership with SPINS and the data insights it gives us on the new products that I am creating and the team is bringing to the market. SPINS tracks the sales of the new items that have been launched over the last six months. And through July 11, 2021, the Tattoo Chef Burrito Bowl is the number one best-selling new SKU in the Mulo frozen plant-based entree category across all key velocity metrics total weekly dollar sales, units per store per week, and dollar sales per store per week. Additionally, Tattoo Chef had four of the top five best performing innovation SKUs in the plant-based frozen entree category launched over the same time period. Considering the other SKUs introduced during the same time period were from legacy frozen entree brands, we are excited about how consumers are responding to Tattoo Chef at retail. In Q2, we launched 14 new SKUs, including our multi-served meal line at Target, and also a new Pattaya smoothie bowl, something we have not seen in mass or grocery yet. In Q3, we plan to launch six innovative items, including a cheeseburger bowl inspired by California flavors with meat alternatives, caramelized onions, and a secret sauce. We're also launching rice cauliflower pad thai. It's sweet and sour with a little kick and uses nostalgic elements of pad thai. I'm especially excited about the launch of our new gluten-free plant-based chicken in our spicy Thai bowl, available now at Sprouts Farmer's Market. We believe it's important to have a variety of meat alternatives in our value-added products to appeal to the growing set of consumers who are newer to plant-based eating. We are excited to introduce the Tattoo Chef to the food service channel as well. In addition to our ready-to-eat products, such as entree and smoothie bowls, we recently launched an 11 SKU portfolio of Tattoo Chef products that can be used to incorporate more plant-based ingredients into their menus. These items are on trend, high quality, convenient to use, and help eliminate food waste, all important attributes in today's dynamic food service industry. In regards to marketing, we successfully launched our first commercials in the beginning of April on a curated list of cable networks, connected TV, and digital media. We are pleased to report we have more than doubled our U.S. brand awareness from 6% to 15%, according to Millward Brown Cancer Research. After just a few months of advertising, purchase consideration for Tattoo Chef is approaching the levels of competitors who have been in the market for years. What we have learned from over the last eight months is that the brand is responsive to advertising. We will continue in the back half of this year to test some other marketing initiatives and next year increase our marketing spend with a disciplined approach to ROI. E-commerce is a minor part of our business today, but I am proud to announce that we will be launching a subscription service later this year as another way for our loyal consumers to shop for Tattoo Chef products. Now I'll turn over to Stephanie to walk through our financials. Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. In the second quarter of 2021, revenue increased 45.9% to 50.7 million compared to 34.8 million for the prior year period. As Sam mentioned, the revenue increase was driven by a 12.7 million increase in revenue of Tattooed Chef branded products. This now accounts for 65% of our total revenue, as well as 4.3 million in revenue from our recent Foods of New Mexico acquisition. As a reminder, we closed the acquisition over halfway through the second quarter on May 14th, so this was only a partial quarter contribution. Gross profit in the second quarter was 8 million, or 15.7% of revenue, 
compared to 3.7 million or 10.8% for the prior year period. The increase in gross margin was primarily due to the increase in branded tattooed chef sales and the investment in manufacturing equipment made in the back half of 2020 that doubled our production capacity in both the United States and Italy. Despite inflationary pressures in freight and container costs, which were 6.7 million during the second quarter of 2021, we were still able to leverage our operating efficiencies and contractual buying opportunities for raw materials due to our vertically integrated business model. Going forward, we anticipate quarterly gross margin expansion throughout the rest of 2021 as we increase our branded volume and as Sam mentioned, quadruple our production capacity. Operating expenses increased to 15.9 million in the second quarter of 2021 compared to 2.1 million in the prior year period. The increase in operating expenses was primarily due to promotional expenses of 3.2 million, marketing expenses of 2.9 million, and professional services, including legal and accounting of 2.6 million. We do not expect operating expenses to decrease as a percentage of revenue over time as many fixed operating expenses will be spread over increased revenue. We are also heavily investing in the Tattoo Chef brand to increase distribution, raise brand awareness, and drive sales in the new stores that are launching products. The costs that we are investing in today should produce realized benefits in the future. Net loss was 53.2 million in the three months ended June 30th, 2021, compared to net income of 1.3 million in the prior year period. There was a one-time non-cash expense of 46 million included in the second quarter of 2021, resulting from a valuation allowance on a deferred tax asset due to the company's additional investment. This adjustment does not affect revenue, gross margin, or adjusted EBITDA. Adjusted EBITDA was negative 5.9 million in the second quarter of 2021 compared to adjusted EBITDA of positive 2 million in the prior year period. The decline was primarily due to public accounting costs that were not present in the second quarter of 2020 and the operating expenses that were just mentioned. As of June 30, 2021, we had cash and cash equivalent of 140.2 million. Now turning to our outlook, we continue to expect total revenue in the range of 235 million to $242 million, an increase of 58 to 63% compared to 2020. We expect the base business, or rather excluding Foods of New Mexico, to grow 49% year over year to $222 million. This is consistent with our projections at the time of the transaction announcement over a year ago and includes the expected distribution wins in the mass and retail channels. We expect a 13 to $20 million contribution from the recent Foods of New Mexico acquisition and do not expect the second facility, Karsten, to have a material impact on 2021 revenue because of the timing of the facility being finished during the fourth quarter. We are updating our full year 2021 gross margin guidance to be between 16 to 22%. We are committed to an aggressive plan of growing our brand through extensive marketing and promotional spending that has already produced significant revenue growth 
in both grocery and mass retail. To augment our revenue growth, we have invested in our staff and infrastructure, equipment, brand visibility, and customer acquisition costs to meet the marketplace demands and our current and future goals. We also continue to be impacted by increases in logistics costs, storage fees, legal and accounting fees, and marketplace shortages in packaging products. Given this, we are updating our adjusted EBITDA guidance to a loss of 14 to $17 million. Lastly, we expect capital expenditures in the range of 15 to $20 million for full year 2021, which includes our recent acquisition of Foods of New Mexico. Tattoo Chef has a long runway for growth with both new and exciting customers and channels an experienced team, and a strong cash position to support the growth of the business. With that, we are now available to take your question. Operator? We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. The first question today will come from George Kelly of Roth Capital Partners. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, maybe if we could start with your EBITDA guidance for the year. So uh, a bit of a, a change uh, since the last time uh, you updated us. So just curious if you could um, maybe bridge exactly what that, you know, I think it was two to four million before. So just what are the primary, could, could you kind of break down the, the, the difference? Absolutely, George. Stephanie here. We are going to spend an additional $3 million in marketing during the back half of this year to take advantage of some of the opportunities that we have discovered in order to build more brand awareness. We have also been building our infrastructure and hiring experienced, talented individuals in what is a very tight job market right now. And we want to build the foundation for that infrastructure, not for the sales and distribution of today, but for the growth of this company next year and the year after. In addition, there is also inflationary costs to freight, cold storage, other logistical items, and upcoming increases in both packaging costs corrugated, and even pallets. And combined with these, we felt that it was important at this time to make this adjustment. Okay, okay, understood. And then uh, next question is just about the uh, all the distribution wins. So uh, really amazing progress on door expansion and uh, distribution points. What's next, I guess? I, I mean, I'm not trying to get too far ahead here. It's been a really crazy year, I know. But what do you think the total opportunity is? If you were to look out maybe to the end of next year or a couple of years from now, I mean, is, is 12,000 doors and how many distribution points? Like, where, where can you take that over time? Hi, George. This is Matt. Um, so, you know, obviously, thank you for the compliment. We're uh, equally as uh, excited about the results that we've had this year. So I think that, you know, there's really a, a two-pronged approach. I mean, the first is, you know, we obviously have uh, established relationships with uh, um, the retailers that we're with today, but Sarah has created a lot of amazing products that not everyone has been accepted. So I think that, you know, we're really encouraged by um, closing those voids on other categories that retailers that we're with today are not carrying. So I would say, you know, that's job one for the sales team is to, to get to that 30 SKU target that we talked about. Um, what we're really excited about is that our SKU acceptance quarter over quarter is actually increasing. So we, we started the first quarter with about 4.4 SKUs accepted per retailer. Um, in Q3, we're going to be up to 7.7. And so we're really excited about the fact that we're seeing like almost like a, a double or over 60% SKU increase, um, increase in our SKU counts that are accepted when we launch with a retailer. 
And so that's really encouraging. Um, the next thing that we're also going to be focused on is still closing a lot of the gaps that we have in terms of customers that we are not with today. Um, we do have regional as well as other customers that are not doing business with us yet. And then we also have opportunity with, uh, with other major retailers today to close store gaps. So, you know, those combined with all the innovation that we have coming, we are uh, obviously very bullish about what the future holds in terms of getting to that 30 store or that 30 count uh, of SKUs across the, uh, the market. Okay. And, and then uh, the, the push, this has come up on prior calls, but the, all, all the success you've had, I mean, exceeding your, your uh, target to start the year as far as uh, doors and distribution points and guidance is staying the same. And so, you know, is there something that is, um, you know, maybe you've seen pressure in certain channels. I don't know if it's club or uh, is the kind of initial um, velocity in a lot of these new uh, channels, maybe not what you thought it could be or any, any can, can you talk at all about just the, the reasoning that uh, goes into maintaining your the, the initial revenue guidance? Hey, George, Sam. So it's really a function of uh, our, our projected you know, acceptance to the products that we thought that we were going to, we really had uh, some good um, knowledge of the, the wins that we were going to get on, on these retailers. And that's really it. We really projected pretty aggressively our guidance on the acceptance of the brand based on, you know, what was happening with club with us. And, and that's why we just were solid right there. And, and, and like, um, you know, uh, like was mentioned in our in our review right now was that, you know, because of the timing of distribution through the year with these retailers getting all this product on the shelf, that's why we really feel we won't we won't we won't feel the full impact until 2022 of all these wins that we're getting with full distribution and the promotional programs that we have planned for 22 now. So that's why we you know we're we're very excited about exactly what's happening. I mean, the, the wins and the acceptance and the, the, you know, the increase of sales per week and units per, per retailer, it's, it's all very, so um, it, it's really incredible. It's very positive. And we think we really got a tiger by the tail here. And we have so many different categories and because of our capabilities, um, any one of these, these sections that we're doing right now, whether, you know, from foods in New Mexico, you know, us stating that, you know, within two to three years, we, we really believe it could be a couple hundred million bucks and, and just with our existing facilities, it's, you know, it, you know, we could be over, we are over a couple hundred million dollars. So to hit that first point of 500 million in revenue, um, we, we feel pretty confident that that's, that's the direction and the opportunity is there for us. Okay, great. And then last question for me, uh, just a, an accounting issue. I remember uh, on the last call, there was a feasibility study that was going on uh, having to do with uh, how you treat certain, you know, whether it's operating expenses or should they go into the cost of goods sold line. Did, is that settled? And are we comparing apples to apples if you look back to last year's second quarter? And that's all I had. Thank you. Thanks, George. It's Stephanie again. So we are comparing apples to apples when we talk about second quarter last year. We have not concluded on the preferability study and we are still working on it and we're hoping to be able to update, provide an update soon. Okay, thanks. The next question is from Rob Dickerson of Jefferies. Please go ahead. Uh, great, thank you so much. Um, try to keep this short, a uh, lot of grounds covered. Um, I guess, you know, the first question I have is just, um, on the revenues in Q2 relative to Q1, right? And I know uh, you called out that some of the private label business, I want to call them losses, sounds like they're more intentional exits. Um, it seems like, you know, those potentially offset maybe some of the brand growth and also, you know, the $4 million included from the food in Mexico. And I'm, I'm just asking because the growth obviously is extremely impressive, right? Year over year, but technically the revenues were, you know, a couple million off relative to Q1. I would think that kind of with some of these new wins, we'd see it be going up, not down, but then 
the delta here is the prime label size. I just don't know what that was. So if you just provide color on that delta Q1, Q2, that's the first question. Hi, Rob, this is Sam. So uh, if we were 100% grocery and mass, and then I understand where there would just be this increase of quarter over quarter, but because we're still, you know, the majority of our brand is still in club, it's based on these LTOs, these, these limited time offers and the distributions and the timing of when, you know, these, these things happen. So, you know, and, but overall, it's like, you see, you know, we're still up over in the year in club year over year, but it's just from a timing standpoint, that's all this is. So, you know, um, we'll see in Q3, I think that you'll really start to see more of this consistent growth start happening as our, our grocery and mass market starts becoming a bigger part of our company. Um, and, and so I, I, I you know, it, it, tr as far as private label goes, it's pretty much flat. You're absolutely correct. You know, the focus is, is definitely been branded and that's where we're really, uh, we're really, you know, pushing. Hey, Robin, okay. if I can just, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Sorry about that, Rob. It's Stephanie. If I can just add to that a little bit, remember that when we look at last year and we talk about the quarter over quarter, and we experienced a lot of growth in 2020 as well, but we did see that big peak in quarter one and we've talked about it. It has to do with organic month and a lot of limited time offers. We ran a very large acai promotion with Costco. And we did run a promotion on organic stir fry, but it's just a blend of products right now at club. So when we start to talk about quarter two, I think that the big focus needs to be on the fact that we grew 46% year over year in quarter two, and we had great growth in quarter one year over year. So this is a little more cyclical for us as it was last year. And we expect this to even out in the future as we expand into more mass and traditional grocery. But those wonderful, you know, club items were fantastic in January. And we will see some of those limited time offers in Q3, as Sarah discussed. So there is a little bit of that that happens throughout the year, but it is still 46% growth. Yeah, okay, no, it completely makes sense. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a function of club exposure, uh, which I get. Um, okay, cool. And then I guess, you know, usually along with LTOs, um, there's some promotional activity, right? Some, some promotional spend. So again, if I'm thinking forward then, you know, would you say collectively, like as you think about the back half of this year, marketing spend goes up a little bit, you're getting into new stores, right? So it's important once you're in the store, you want to make sure the velocities are good. Then maybe, like you said, there could be some TO activity kind of near term Q3-ish, but kind of overall, there could also be just some kind of upfront promotional activity to also make sure you're getting the brand going, you know, in the new stores. Just trying to get a sense of how you think about that promotional dynamic. How, so, so what is the plan for, so as we continue to, so as, as our retail and grocery math is going to start coming on more aggressively in the second half, absolutely. That's why Stephanie suggested that, you know, why she said that we are going back in with the, an additional $3 million promotion, uh, you know, spend on the back half of the year, in, you know, and, and still against all the products with all these major retailers, there's tremendous marketing plans that are already built into this. And, and I know Matt, if you want to. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think you said it. We're, you know, this extra 3 million bucks that we've got built into the plan, George, is all around, you know, we did the, the broad campaign to build awareness. That money is now there to spend to drive velocity, right? We're getting closer to the retailer. We want to make sure that our our uh, new distribution wins are um, successful. And so we're really investing in programs that are there to drive um, purchase and, uh, and, and conversion at, uh, the point, at the point of sale. So that's where you're seeing that come in. Okay, okay, good, yeah. fair enough. Um, and then I guess just to come back to the margin question, um, 
obviously understand you know what's driving that uh, you know that lower EBITDA in the near term. Sounds like you said you're hiring more people. Um, so I guess you know first question is uh, you know it seems like essentially you could just sum it up and say tell me if this is fair. You know relative to where you were in Q1 and Q2 you said okay we actually got some new wins we need some more people to hire some more people and then you know as we've heard from a lot of food companies there are also some other incremental costs that are coming in be it you know uh product cost packaging freight what what have you so it's really like there's three million right in the marketing side but then you know there's um call it you know another uh you know 10 million or so you know that are other costs and assuming that those other costs are the buckets that you explained that just trying to get a sense as to kind of like what what kind of change through the quarter that made you decide to you know or let's say increase your overall cost basis uh, outside of the incremental marketing promo spend absolutely rob i think that when we start to talk about inflationary costs that some of these items were things that as we looked at them at the end of the year and even through the first quarter seemed to be temporary. And I believe that a lot of people assumed that we would be more on a road to recovery by this point in time after the pandemic than we currently are. And the fact of the matter is, is that freight and container costs do not seem to be decreasing. Fuel prices do not seem to be decreasing. And there are things that we can all see. And so we would like to take the conservative approach after analyzing our data and the information with our providers in logistics and things of that nature that honestly, after we saw the increase of roughly 1.84% in freight and container costs when it's taken as a percentage of revenue compared to last year, we want to be very cautious in this. We are starting to hear things about packaging shortages and paper shortages and those types of things. We made sure that our raw material inflation prices were not going to be an issue in the back half of this year, we have talked about it. And it's one of those things in which the things that we are able to control and do better, we are. I know that I have heard other companies who have quoted higher inflation rates on some of these items. It's not that we're necessarily doing better than they are. We've just made other changes within our system and within the infrastructure to help mitigate some of those costs. And we are focusing on costs, which will improve the gross margin within the operations themselves. Okay, good enough. That's all I have. Thank you so much. And this concludes the question and answer session. I would now like to turn the conference back Ooh. over to Sam Galetti for any closing remarks. Thank you for joining us today. We're pleased with our results for the first half of the year and expect our momentum to continue in the second half. With our incredible brand, innovation pipeline, manufacturing expertise, and with the team and resources we have available, I believe we are well positioned for long-term growth and success. I look forward to speaking to you again at the upcoming investor events and on our third quarter earnings call in November. Have a great day. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you all for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect your lines. Have a great day. Okay, so we're finally done. <laughs> Got a little bit boring there towards the end. Um, some interesting things that they talked about in the call that you wouldn't have gotten just from the report. I'm going to hit, uh, well, I'm going to make a video on them. So be on the lookout for that. I'm going to make it like right as I hang up here, but a couple of the things that they talked about, and there's a lot in there that like at the first part, I was watching the price a little bit more. So I didn't miss a little bit of it, but they did talk about how their SKUs go up over time with each person that they work with or each company. Also, they expect to hit 12,000 uh, 12, stores, I believe, by the third quarter. They're at 8,300 uh, right now, 83.55 at the end of last quarter. Uh, they had issues with supply chain, so freight, cold storage, high shipping expenses. That's all stuff that uh, definitely hurt their bottom line. And then they had that one-off expense. Then also, they... I don't think they've given revenue guidance for next year before. I could be wrong, but I don't remember that. And they had, they mentioned that they'll give full guidance next quarter, uh, or actually 
two quarters from now. So February of 2022, they'll give out full year guidance. But if I heard that right, they threw out the number 300 million, which they're expecting 240 or so this year. So that would be a 25% increase going into next year. Something interesting that I found actually from Beyond Meat is that they had a huge increase in Q2 sales. So they had Q2 revenue of 149.4 million, which is 32% more than Q1, but their food service sales, so their, their sales from restaurants 3X over the quarter. So it went up dramatically. The stock price dumped after their earnings because they gave a really soft Q3 earnings uh, estimate. They said 120 to 140 million. They, uh, I think they lowered it because there are a lot of fears over the pandemic right now. They also, uh, so you can kind of take your, take your threat there, whether you want to be invested in Tattooed Chef, which probably did worse over the quarter because more people went out to eat, as you can tell by Beyond Meat's numbers going up so dramatically, or you can go with Beyond Meat. And then if we go back and uh, we go through another pandemic or even over the winter, right? A lot of their sales depend on fast food and uh, food services. They also talked about a subscription coming. They didn't really talk too much about that, but they said they would help people that really like their, their products. And they see consistent growth coming in Q3. The lower revenue is mostly due to the timing of different specials with some of their per, some of the people that they work with, some of the companies. So those were actually most of my notes then from the conference call. Uh, the price is down 9% right now. I did end up buying some on the dip. So I got it, uh, I think, right around the price that it is now. I bought it like uh, almost an hour ago, uh, right when the conference call started, really. So I did buy the dip. Um, I added about, what is that, 5%, 4 or 5% um, more shares than I had before. So I plan on making a video kind of going over the whole thing. If you miss the numbers, we'll talk about it, and I'll give some more insights from the earnings report. I also have a video planned on ADA Cardano for later tonight, too. Hopefully, I can make that. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you for hitting the like button and be on the lookout. I will try to make that video as quickly as possible, kind of wrapping up this whole thing for Tattooed Chef. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.